Hi folks, Howard here. Welcome to Complexity Unraveled. If this is the first time on this channel, we cover a wide range of topics from technology, mega trends, business venture, to macroeconomic and social issues. To put it differently, we are interested in topics that are complex in nature and of great relevance to the society. On this channel, no one will ask you to like, share, or subscribe. Please click on nothing, smash nothing, and buy nothing. If you share our interest in this kind of topics, please give us 15 minutes of your attention and we promise to make it worthwhile. You see, people love talking about climate action. I mean, that is probably the topic that automatically brings consensus in the entire room, as long as you mention words like renewable, sustainability, circularity, etc. Fast majority of the people believe we are on the right path. The only problem is the pace of progression. Simply put, too little, too slow. This stance actually has a significant implication. It implies that if we can manage to scale up what we have been doing and what we are doing, and do it faster, cheaper, at a grand scale, we can and we will get things under control. But nothing could be further from the truth. Our climate action is literally one-dimensional. Reduce carbon emission by building more and more renewable energy capacity. That's basically it. I mean, we did a video on the progression of energy transition a while back. If you're interested, feel free to take a look. The TLDR version is that, after decades of effort, renewable energy accounts for only 3% of our final energy consumption. Even with its steady growth, renewable deployment is still being outpaced by increasing energy demand. And as a result, despite reaching almost 3 terawatt renewable capacity, more fossil fuel than ever is being burned to run our society. In this video, we want to shed some light on the prospect of global carbon peak and explain why we believe something else in addition to energy transition will be absolutely required to fight climate change in a meaningful way. Let me start by explaining why we call the climate action one-dimensional. You see, food shortage is also a global challenge, more so in the backdrop of the current war in Ukraine. If the same approach was used to ensure food security as in the case of climate change, the answer would be absolutely absurd. Just eating less. That would be the answer. Some activists would probably give us another emotional lecture and ask the overweighted population a simple question. How dare you? And the society will be so moved and start transforming our body and soul, dedicate ourselves to the ultimate life achievement, eating nothing. I know this sounds super provocative, but hear me out. There is a fundamental assumption that determines whether the current climate action would work or not. Every bit of climate action is built up on this foundation, which argues a rapid and drastic reduction of global carbon emission can be achieved in a financially and technically feasible way. And as soon as we reach the point of net zero, the nature will take care of the rest. If you look at any studies done by credible institutions or organizations, unless the carbon emission drops off the cliff, or the chance of keeping global warming under 2 degrees is close to zero. So, it's just going to drop like a stone. I mean, the history might tell. In 1918, the carbon emission dropped 18% due to Spanish flu, and rebounded 15% just one year later. During the Great Depression, the carbon emission dropped a whopping 35%, and once again climbed back in just a few years. In 2009, during the financial crisis, carbon emission decreased by almost 0.5 gigaton, and once again added 1.65 gigaton in 2010. The recent drop was caused by the pandemic. Carbon emission dropped 6.4% in 2020, and you guessed it, it roared back just 12 months later. There is a rather peculiar rumor on the internet, and often cited and quoted by many that global carbon emission peaked in 2019. And to be honest, even after hours and hours of digging, I'm still not sure where it comes from. Maybe because in the IEA report from 2020, it suggested that the carbon emission won't come back to 2019 level until 2030. So some people might just interpret this as evidence that carbon emission peaked in 2019. 
Well, here's the thing. We're already back there. Compared with 2019 level, China and India, the number one and number three largest carbon emitting nations in absolute terms, their carbon footprint increased 5.5 and 4.4 percent respectively. Also on the global level, we're already back at the pre-pandemic level. There are so many reasons why the 21st century is often labeled as the Asian century. Asia is home to 4.5 billion people, roughly 60% of the world population. The combined GDP reaches $37 trillion, accounts for almost 40% of global GDP. But the economic growth comes with a hefty price tag. It's also responsible for 50% of the global carbon emission. I think it's reasonable to say carbon emission in Asia would be a suitable starting point for our further discussion. You see, coal is often considered the dirtiest kind of fossil fuel and the greatest enemy in terms of carbon emission. I'm not sure whether you remember this. India and China were bombarded during last year's COP26 because these two nations refused to phase out coal. But here's the thing. They are not alone. Look at aging developing countries and their plan for the future of coal-fired power plant. It knows only two policy directions expansion and accelerated expansion. For many countries, the capacity of coal-fired power plant will double in the next decades. Well, there is this common perception that global coal consumption peaked back in 2013-2014. This was true for quite a few years, but unfortunately not anymore. We are set up for a new record high. In both India and Southeast Asia, capacity of coal-fired power plant is expected to grow double digit in the upcoming years. And it's probably just the beginning. You see, even though India is the third largest carbon emitter in the world, its power generation capacity is just around 400 gigawatt. To put things into perspective, despite similar population size, India's power generation capacity is less than 20% of China's capacity. For both India and Southeast Asia, it's safe to assume that the energy demand and carbon emission will rise alongside the economic growth. In the recent estimation, India's carbon emission will increase 60% in the next 20 years. And the same goes for Southeast Asia. Based on the current policy and the development trajectory, demand for oil, natural gas, and coal will steadily grow in the next 20 to 30 years. Even though the sustainable development scenario from IEA would require a 70% decrease from today's level, carbon emission in Southeast Asia is expected to grow 60% by 2050. So what does all this mean for the global climate effort? Let's assume all the major players, but excluding China, could 100% deliver the climate targets in their current policies. And let me be clear, the current policy means reality. Not what should be done, what could be done, or what might be done, but what will likely be done. In this scenario, by 2040, emission reduction in the US and Europe will simply be offset by the emission increase in India and Southeast Asia, resulting in a zero-sum game. I think now is a good time to bring Africa into the equation. Not because of their emission, I mean it's really small only accounts for like 2-3% of global carbon emission and most likely will remain a very small portion for a very long time. I want to use Africa to point out one very specific issue in the climate context that is often ignored. The climate financing. Please go read for yourself, for instance, report for the COP26 in Glasgow from last year. Regardless which report, done by which institution or organization, you will find pages upon pages of what needs to be done, but nothing about the financing. We have to be fair. Just recently, after the G20 meeting held in Bali, the developed nations committed $100 billion annual financial support for climate action in developing countries. I mean, that's a lot of money. Things should be fine with $100 billion a year, right? Well, now you see why I want to talk about Africa for a bit. In order to reach their climate target, the African countries would require $1.6 trillion for the remaining eight years until 2030. That is $200 billion a year for Africa alone. 
Right now, the financing gap in Africa is estimated at $1.3 trillion, and the gap is expected to grow even further in the future. I hope you can see my points now. India, Southeast Asia, Africa, all these developing countries need the financial support to fight climate change. The aid provided by developed nations is not even enough for a single continent. Now you can make up your own opinion whether developing countries can deliver on their climate targets or not. Let me also briefly talk about Europe. I think no one would disagree that Europe is the vanguard of energy transition. I would even go so far and say, over the years, energy transition has become part of European identity. But here's the thing. Renewable is not a silver bullet that will magically save the day. In terms of energy sources, nothing is truly carbon neutral. To determine how clean is an energy source, we can look at the so-called carbon intensity, which is essentially the CO2 emission per kilowatt hour generated electricity. And this might surprise you. Even though natural gas is often marketed as clean fossil fuel, its carbon emission is only 20% smaller compared to coal under the same condition. Solar and wind clearly have a much smaller carbon footprint, but no matter how small they are, they will add to the global emission. Right now, the carbon intensity of the energy mix in the EU is roughly 275 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour. In order to keep the global warming under 2 degrees and uphold the EU's 2050 net zero commitment, the energy carbon intensity needs to be reduced to 15 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour. That represents a 96% drop from today's level. And we are talking about the European Union, one of the most, if not the most, environmentally conscious and friendly region in the world. A 96% drop in energy carbon intensity means one thing. Solar, wind, and nuclear would be the only energy sources that would be allowed. No LNG, not even hydro. It basically means to tear down and rebuild the entire energy infrastructure that we spent hundreds of trillions of dollars to build over the past 150 years. A minute literally. You see, the traditional power grid system is essentially a centralized top-down system. A unidirectional system. Electricity in that system flows from power plants to the point of consumption in one direction. Renewable energy on the other side requires decentralized bottom-up design, which allows electricity flows from wherever it's generated to wherever it's needed. So I have to ask the question, how realistic is a complete overhaul of the entire energy infrastructure? Maybe this doesn't sound so crazy after all, but do you remember this zero-sum game we mentioned earlier? It might be the best case scenario. I mean, after all, we haven't even taken into account the dumpster fire in the Eurozone and the upcoming recession caused by decade-long crazy monetary policy. If you're still not convinced, well, we have one more card to play. China. Being by far the country with the largest carbon footprint, China accounts for one-third of the global carbon emission. The number two US has only 4.5 gigaton, a number three India not even 3 gigaton. As a matter of fact, you have to put the other nine countries on the top 10 list together to match China's emission. We cannot overstate this enough how energy hungry is the Chinese economy. In 2020, the global energy consumption was roughly 560 exajoule. China alone consumed 145 exajoule. That is more than a quarter of global energy demand. It's only fair to point out that on a per capita basis is still much lower compared with US. Nevertheless, in absolute terms, China dwarfs every single nation on this planet. To put things into perspective, the total energy consumption in entire Europe in 2020 was merely 77 exajoule, slightly over half of the energy consumption in China. With all this being said, it's probably quite obvious why carbon peak in China is so significant for the global carbon peak. Just recently, China announced its target to reach carbon peak by 2027 at 12.2 gigaton. That would be a huge step forward if China could actually put it off. 
it was celebrated as the hope on the horizon for climate protection. I mean, sure, if the world's largest emitter with one third of global carbon emission would peak in just five years, that would be something worth celebrating. But how realistic is China's 2027 target? First of all, compared with 2021 level, which was 11.9 gigaton, it would represent a teeny tiny 2% increase, a rather marginal increase from today's level. This would mean China's carbon emission has already plateaued. Despite its energy-hungry economy, relatively low GDP per capita, and moderate economic growth in the foreseeable future, the carbon emission would stay range-bound and only fluctuate in a very tight range in the next few years. If that is the case, the use of carbon-intensive energy source like coal must have stagnated. Why don't we look into it? China is the largest producer and consumer of coal worldwide by a mile. Even though China accounts for 40% of installed wind and solar capacity globally, it's still very reliant on fossil. 56% of its energy comes from coal. I know it sounds awful, but we have to remember it was 70% in the mid of 2000. Although this job doesn't really come from facing down the use of coal, but from the increased overall energy demand. If we look at the coal consumption in China in the last 10 years, it barely changed. The coal consumption in China will probably stay at this high level for a little bit longer. You see, China has the largest fleet of coal-fired power plants, accounts for 50% of global capacity, reaching almost 1,000 gigawatt. The combined capacity is expected to grow from 1,000 gigawatt to 1,300 gigawatt by 2030, even though more than 360 gigawatt of capacity would be required to be either retired or put into reserve to reach the climate target. You see, in China's 14th Five Years Plan, energy security, food security, and financial security form the cornerstones for China's further development. There is no doubt that China is quite reliant on energy import. But if we look a little bit deeper, China imports 70% of its oil, 50% of its gas. But for coal, imports accounts for only 10%. Not to mention with 13%, China has the fourth largest global coal reserve only behind the United States, Russia, and Australia. In that sense, it was perfectly accurate when the Chinese President Xi stated that China is rich in coal, poor in oil, and short on gas, and people should not drift away from the reality. I don't believe anyone would disagree with the crucial role coal has played in the context of China's energy self-reliance. Some of you might still remember this. Last year, China was hit by a wave of energy shortage. It was so severe that the grid operator had to ration energy consumption. This energy crisis, as some people labeled it, made the importance of coal in the Chinese economy and the society as clear as daylight, and strengthened the role of coal in China's energy mix. As a result, in 2021, China has produced more than 4 billion tons of coal, another all-time high. And there's still more to come. In the first two months of 2022 alone, five new coal-fired power plants have received approvals from state authorities with combined capacity of 7.3 gigawatt. In February, three mining projects got green-lighted, with combined investment reaching nearly $4 billion. Just a few weeks ago, a new mega coal hub was announced in the Inner Mongolia that is expected to produce for the next 97 years. I know there are tons of stats in this video. Let me try to wrap this up in a simple manner. China, India, and Southeast Asia combined, the 3.5 billion population represents almost half of the world population. Their combined carbon footprint reaches 16.5 gigaton, representing almost 50% of the global carbon emission. All three of them are still growing. All three of them are facing increased energy demands. All three of them are planning to build even more coal-fired power plants. Their economic success has been and will be largely supported by cheap labor, cheap land, and cheap energy, at least for the foreseeable future. And there's one more thing. 
don't place your hope in Mother Nature. It will not be there to solve this problem for us. Ocean is by far the largest carbon sink on this planet. Ocean acidification reduces its ability to absorb CO2, and it might reach its limit in about 30 years. Of course, we can talk about the trees. Two of the three largest rainforests on this planet, the Amazon Basin and the rainforests in Southeast Asia, have already turned carbon positive, caused by the agriculture practice and livestock farming. And let's not forget permafrost. Permafrost carbon feedback might release over 500 gigatons of CO2 back into the atmosphere by the end of this century. I sincerely hope I'm wrong on this one. But global carbon peak doesn't appear to be on the horizon, not based on everything that we have discussed so far. And carbon emission will not drop off a cliff. That's simply wishful thinking. So, is there a way out? You see, what makes human species so special is our ability to solve problems. Technology will be the key. We firmly believe negative emission technology or active carbon removal will be an indispensable part of the climate solution, not to replace the energy transition, but in addition to the energy transition. I really hate cliffhanger, but we really want to do that topic just and address it properly in the upcoming video. So until then, thank you for tuning in and take care.